This is Channel 10 Nelson, your community access television. Programming on this channel is made by local volunteers. If you would like to be a part of your community television, please call 354-4200 or write to Shaw Cable, 613 Ward Street, Nelson, B1L1T2. Something I've just never seen. 
So I'm not turning mine in because I've decided to recycle it by wearing it to every conference I go to from now on. I can just say, sorry, I don't need your badge. I'm generally a speaker, so I can keep the little red tag. And I can just add this at the Nelson School Board Get High on Nature conference, and I don't need your badge. Thank you. So I wanted to talk today about trying to pull together some of the themes. I sort of made an overambitious topic for myself by thinking you've heard from some of the, well, Actually, with the case of Stephen Schneider, not only one of Canada's experts, but one of the world's leading experts. So you've heard about global warming from one of the two people. You've heard about, and I think Jim Fulton and, and uh, Joe Cummins, you've heard from people who have a really broad range of experience and know a lot about the problems that we're facing. So what I thought I'd try to do is pull some of that together, recognizing that what we often do in conferences is we talk about symptoms. And this can be kind of frustrating because you know you're never really getting at what the problem is. You know, global warming is a symptom of something. The uh, ozone depletion is a symptom. Poverty is a symptom. Uh, acid rain is a symptom. Deforestation is a symptom. But what's, what's the cause? Where, where can we start making changes that go fundamentally to the way we behave as human society? And when we realize what those changes are, then we can focus on them. And I think then we can have some hope that we can accomplish those changes. In thinking about this, I was remembering, and I hope I have it right, because I didn't get to do my research. I needed to get a hold of Alice in Wonderland to do this little bit of research, because what I remember is Alice going along at one point, and there's a fork in the road, and there's a house in the middle, and it was either the Queen of Hearts or a witch. This is where my research isn't so good. And she stopped to ask directions. And she said, which road should I take? Which is the right road? And the woman in the house said, well, the old woman, well, that depends. Where do you want to go? Well, I don't know. The woman, it doesn't really matter which road you take, does it? And that's sort of where we are as a society. We know there's some choices here. And as a society and as governments and in the way that we behave, we don't know what way we're going. We don't know where we want to end up. So it doesn't really matter what road we take. And that's the challenge for us is to exert that the, the political will and the strength and the confidence to say, well, we do know what, where we want to go, and therefore it makes a great difference what road we take. And I think in a way that opening night when Stephen Schneider showed that chart, which some of you may still be able to, to call out of your memory banks, but what it was was a chart of different scenarios of human behavior and what that would mean in terms of carbon dioxide release. Remember there was one very, very steep curve that was if everything went roughly as badly as it possibly could, China went to coal, we kept behaving the way we are now and didn't change, the biological feedbacks didn't help us and so on. And then there were a couple intermediate ones, and then there was a real low growth one that was labeled on the curve, the Amy Lovins scenario of maximum energy efficiency, maximum conservation, looking to alternative fuels, behaving very differently in our society, as well as seeing developing countries go the same way that we now want to go. In other words, getting them to leapfrog their opportunities to get rich the way we have and move right into the alternatives, avoiding fossil fuels. Well, those in a sense, those little lines on a graph are really different roads. And that's what we're really talking about. They're not, if, as Dr. Schneider said, they're not scientifically for sure eventualities. They're entirely based on the way we as human society behave and they're based on what road we decide to take. Well, one of the things that can help in figuring out how we choose the right road, how do we get to that really, really low CO2, like not really low actually, it's a slight buildup over where we are now, which is the highest in the history of, of the planet, but never mind that. We want to get to the lowest possible, best scenario road. So one way to figure out how to get there is to figure out what road we're on now and how we got there and how we got in the fix we're in. And in that case, I found the Brunton Report very helpful in getting some perspective, not only on where we are now, but on how we got there. Now, the Brunton Report has been referred to a lot with the assumption that everybody knows about it, but I just want to quickly, for people who don't, because a lot of, well, actually, when you speak to an audience in Canada, most people know about it. When I speak to an audience in the U.S., you get real blank stares. They've never heard of it there. <laughs> it's discouraging. But the, uh, this is the report of the United Nations Commission called the World Commission on Environment and Development. <coughs> Very important to note. We think of it as an environmental report, but
But this was a report that also dealt with that human environment that we just heard about. This dealt very clearly with development issues and the crisis of developing countries where most of the world's people live in conditions that we would not tolerate. So this report, World Commission on Environment and Development, was chaired by the woman who was then the Prime Minister of Norway, Drew Harlan Brundtland. It's called Our Common Future, and it was asked yesterday of Jim Fulton where he could get it. It should be available in every bookstore. It should be, the government of Canada should buy it, stick it in every school library. But it's called Our Common Future, and it's published by Oxford University Press. And this commission of 21 people from around the world traveled around, went to public hearings, listened to people, and then wrote the report reflecting a consensus. In other words, they all got to the point of agreement, even though some of them, one was from the Soviet Union, one was from Colombia, one was from Brazil, one was from Indonesia, one was from the US, one was from Canada. They come from vastly different political and economic systems, and yet they were all able to agree. Now, the fact that they were all able to agree means that some of the hardliners, people who might take our positions a little more clearly, uh, had to compromise a bit. It means that the term that came out of it is controversial, and I won't get into all that now, maybe in questions and answers, but it, it still, to me, reflects a very, very important document. It was published in 1987, and a lot has changed in the world because of the force of the arguments here that we have to change the way we're doing things. And what it pointed to, again, is that the environmental crisis is not purely an environmental crisis. It's also a development crisis. In, in, in other words, poverty in the developing world, the fact that 20% of us in the industrialized world use up 80% of the world's resources, means that the 80% of the people in the developing world get 20%. In other words, they get our leftovers. That's part of the environment crisis. That has to be addressed in changing our course and, and moving towards a different kind of a society. It means that everything is connected. And the ecological statement that you heard from Dr. Cummins, Barry Commoner's first rule, everything is connected to everything else, that's not only an ecological principle, that's a principle that applies to the global human family. We are all connected to each other. And somebody in a refugee camp is our brother or our sister, just as surely as an owl or an eagle is our brother or our sister. So we're all connected to each other. And that's one of the things the Brunton Report focuses on. It also focuses on the reality that the military expenditures are part of the problem, a big part of the problem. The Brunton Report said these are interlocking issues. And the fact that the world economy, the total amount of money that goes around in the world in the course of a year, is now about $13 trillion. And every year for the last couple of years, we've spent over $1 trillion of that on war and preparation for war. In Canada, obviously the U.S. is a big spender, about 30% of that is the U.S. But a lot of the poorest countries in the world spend a huge amount of what money they have available in preparation for war and often to keep down their own population. Right? Not keeping down the numbers, I mean suppressing their political rights within their own country. So this is a big part of the environmental crisis as well. Now the Brunton Report, in addition to pointing out that these crises are interlocking, now this is, in a sense it's discouraging because you think it's not just one thing, we can't just focus on cleaning up the environment, we have to now look at social justice, peace, uh, a habitable world, enough food for everybody, it's all connected. But the good news is when something is all connected, when you find that all the symptoms may come back to one or two root causes, it means that when you can address those one or two root causes, you can get change in all the other areas and all the symptoms start to go down and get better. One of the things that Brutley did which was helpful for me in this report was pointing out that the seeds of the current situation we find ourselves in were certainly sown by the Industrial Revolution. But the bulk of the damage hasn't been sort of a slow, steady rise since the point at which we got the steam engine. No, what the Brunton Report points out is that, say, in the last hundred years, since, since 1900, the use of fossil fuels around the world has increased by 30 times. Okay? 30 times more fossil fuels consumed now than in 1900. It also points out that there has been a 50-fold increase in industrial production. So compared to 1900 to now, 50 times more industrial production. What's interesting about both of those statistics is that that wasn't a slow, steady increase. Four-fifths of the increase in industrial production and three-quarters of the increase in fossil fuel consumption happened since 1950. That's 
40 year period. In that 40 year period, which for me, since I was born in 1954, 1950s did not sound like they were that long ago. For those of you who were born a lot more recently, uh, it may seem a long time, but it's really sort of part of our cultural memory. I mean, if you can practically find the 1950s, if you can find a Leave it to Beaver rerun. Okay? That, that's the idealized lifestyle of the 1950s. So what happened between the 1950s and now to cause this huge growth spurt, virtually straight up? should also note that in that period, in, the, in 1950, there were 2.5 billion people on planet Earth. That number doubled right, in the last 35, 37 years. It's now over 5 billion people, as Mr. Dirks pointed out. And that doubling time of 40 years is the fastest doubling time in the history of the planet. When Christ was born, I don't know if anyone has a guess how many people were living on planet Earth. Anyone want to venture a guess how many people were on planet Earth when Christ was born? Counting him. <laughs> 200 million. Now, how long do you suppose it took to double that to get to 400 million? Keep in mind our last doubling time from 2.5 billion people to 5 billion people was just under 40 years. How long do you suppose it took to just get from 200 million to 400 million? How many? Hundred? Anyone else? Thousand? Get it? Warmer? Up? Up? 1,500. Bingo. 1,500 years to double from 200 million to 400 million, and we just doubled from 2.5 billion to 5 billion in 40 years. 1,500 years, the first doubling. So obviously, population pressures can be considered a big part of why that consumption pattern went straight up. Paul Ehrlich, who's also been mentioned in this conference, mentioned a lot by uh, Dr. Schneider, wrote a book called Population Bomb in 1970, and people thought, oh, well, he's a little bit off the deep end. He would turn out to be dead right. But that doesn't explain it totally, because most of the population growth in the last 40 years, as you've also heard, 90% of it was really taking place in the developing world. And the people in the developing world are not the big consumers of fossil fuels and industrial production that we are. For instance, any average North American uses 80 times as much energy as someone in sub-Saharan Africa. So it can't solely be put on the population explosion. So why did we have this from 1950 to now straight up? Well, from here on, I'm leaving the Bruntman Report and going with my theory, which is also based on television and Leave it to Beaver. My theory is that television had a lot to do with this, and that some really ingenious ideas of changing us from being citizens, which is how we used to refer to ourselves, voters, citizens, the public, people in the community, very subtly we became called something else. Consumers, right, right. We were suddenly consumers, as if that's the most important thing we did. It wasn't that we think, that we vote, that we read, that we create art or music, or have good friends, or do well in our jobs, no. The most important thing about us, and the way we've been described for a long time, and we've taken it, is we are consumers. And it's hard to deny. None of us are non-consumers, none of us are negative consumers, we all eat and we at least buy something sometimes. But can that be the most important thing we are? Well, there's another thing that went along with the idea we were consumers, and that was getting us to consume more stuff, more and more and more all the time. Now, how do you do this? I mean, there's a finite limit to what people really can use and fill in their house. Obviously, we haven't, a lot of people don't agree with that. Um, born to shop, bumper stickers notwithstanding, uh, you obviously have some point at which your house is full. So there were two very clever things that came along to sell us more stuff. Planned obsolescence. This was a brilliant idea. Up until about the Second World War, people built things there was the notion of pride in workmanship. Something was built to last. You bought a car, you bought a house, you checked it around, you expected to be there a long time, use it a long time. My dad, up until he started growing a beard, which was about 10 years ago, but anyway, he used the same razor that he was issued in the beginning of the Second World War. He had a metal razor and he used it. That was the only razor he ever had. Someone got the bright idea that we could introduce, throw away everything. So in the big items, they would be built in such a way that when they broke down, the parts were no longer available to fix them. Planned obsolescence. You didn't want to be able to keep that car on the road, that fridge working, whatever. 
And another thing that went along with this was the idea that we were a throwaway society and that it was okay to buy something for one use and then toss it away. That's another nice feature of this conference that I should mention. The first conference I've ever been to where we were issued our own mugs and told to bring them. This is a very important precedent. And when you read the small print on your mug, it even says it was made with recycled glass. It's a very, very important thing. But we've been trained not to remember to bring our own mugs. I found out a really interesting story. Do you know the, the green garbage bags that we usually call glad bags were actually a Canadian invention? Yeah. A Canadian came up with the idea of a garbage bag. Now, going back to these to be, does anybody, any of you guys do a watch David Beaver? Am I, am I hearkening back to something that no one ever sees? Oh, good. Okay. So you know what we're talking about here. When the bees had to pick out the garbage, there were no glad bags. There was a galvanized metal trash can, right? When the Canadian inventor tried to market the idea of a plastic garbage bag, they ran into a lot of trouble. First problem, well, first, first they get a manufacturer interested in it. Someone bought the idea. Pilot projects will try to sell this idea. It was not intuitive to human beings in the 1950s, who did live a sort of a, what we call a decent standard of living kind of lifestyle, especially in North America. We're not talking about the rest of the world yet. It was not part of our nature to think that we should go out and spend money on something that we were going to fill with garbage and leave on the curb. This was a bit of a problem. So first you had to convince people that it made a lot of sense to spend money on something you were going to fill with trash and leave on the curb, that this would improve your life. Well, they got over that hurdle. Then they had some, another problem. The garbage people, now, I, I admit, this is an, I'm making a non-sexist term here, but I think it's probably fair to say the garbage men. When they went along on the trucks, their first reaction was to open up the garbage bag, dump the contents into the truck, and leave the bag on the curb, thus defeating the whole purpose of selling us on a product we didn't need. Well, you can see what's happened now. One thing about a green garbage bag, which is just fabulous, is that if you don't have a galvanized one, you never really have more garbage. You don't notice that you've got more than any reasonable person would put on the curb. You have sort of a, a self-test when you have one or two galvanized bags, galvanized tins. When you put those out and you suddenly have more than you can fit in there, you say, oh, geez, we've got to cut back on the garbage. We're filling up too much. When you have a bag of garbage bags, you can put two, three, four, nothing to you, it's just garbage bags. So that's encouraged a certain amount of wastefulness that went along with excess packaging, that went along with developing bags that people were just going to put on the curb. And now we have, I mean, they're practically designer garbage bags. They have drawstrings, you know, and it, we're buying them to put them away one time, right? So this is the sort of psychology. This is what got us sold on being extremely wasteful. We could become consumers. And gradually, over the last 40 years, the things that used to define a town, right, what were the big sort of civic symbols of a community? Well, it was, for a long time, it was the church, maybe it was the town hall, the place where people would congregate, might be the village meeting place, might be church on Sunday. I mean, I don't need to make it too obvious here. What would you say now is the central meeting place in any community, the pride and joy, the place you tell people to go visit? The mall, we've been mall, right? We've been mall, and the Edmonton Mall is a, sh is a tourist attraction. Well. It seems to me that there's something wrong with a society that decided that the most fun thing you can do on a weekend is wander around under fluorescent lights looking at all the junk someone else wants you to buy. It's not really fun. But for most teenagers in Canada, that's the main thing that people do for fun is hang out at the mall. And it, it's not really, I mean, it's rather sad that that's now what we've got for fun. But it all fits in. It's all part of a piece. We are consumers. We are supposed to buy junk, and by buying junk, we stimulate the economy. We produce jobs, we produce revenue, we're changing money like mad, we have to make more money to keep up with all the junk we want to buy, and we never have quite enough. There's no end to this, because as soon as you have the state-of-the-art VCR, out come CD players. We'll never keep up. So that's why we have to look at lifestyle patterns in the industrialized world. Because what we're really talking about is not just that our quality of life has been improved as a result we've put out all this junk. 
Our quality of life has probably not improved in the last 40 years. I mean, my parents, my grandparents, they had good lives. Now, some places that's not true. You can look at places where you definitely had to get in electrification, you had to get better health care and so on. But for the most part, there's not a, we're not talking about going back to the Stone Age. We're talking about a 40-year period where we've gone haywire. You know, it's like we've had one heck of a party. And we've just thrown all the trash out the window, and now it's beginning to stink. We can't live in the house anymore. Okay, so what, what kind of root causes are there here? Well, I've talked about economics, and I've talked a little bit about GMP. I want to just examine GMP really quickly. The idea of gross national product is a very important concept. And I'm going to read to you a little bit. I don't usually read things, but I really like this. This is a, a speech that was given that I heard in Africa last month, August. And it was delivered by the man who is the current Secretary of Environment for Brazil. His name is Jose Lutzenberger. Now, if you can imagine for a moment that Mulroney suddenly lost his mind and made David Suzuki Minister of Environment, or found his mind, depending on how you look at it, um, the search for Brian Mulroney's brain. Yeah, you know, get the army to leave Oka and look around Ottawa. Anyway, suppose that that had happened. That's the equivalent of what happened in Brazil. They made the country's most radical ecologist the Secretary of Environment. It's quite amazing. And he's hanging in there. But he gave a very interesting speech. And of course, he's coming from a developing world perspective. He's coming from a place that pays $1 billion a month in interest payments on its debts. He's coming from a place where he knows the reason that other people in his cabinet want to build dams on all the rivers in the Amazon is to generate hydroelectric power so cheap that they can call in the transnational aluminum smelting companies and make tin cans for North Americans, aluminum cans, in order to reduce the balance of payments and improve the situation to be able to pay off the debt. So Lutzenberger has this very strong sense of how global <laughs> economics are driving the destruction of the rainforest in Brazil, as well as he also happened to speak at this meeting in Nairobi, I should tell you, it, in his words, that the most magnificent forests of the, of the planet were being destroyed. The beautiful, ancient, temperate rainforests of British Columbia being clear-cut. And he gave a stirring speech. He pointed out that he at one point argued with a British Columbia forester, and point, pointed out, he said, do you not, when you approach a tree that's 2,000 years old and cut it down, do you not feel you are committing a sacrilege? And he said, the forester was very upset and accused me of bringing religious concepts into something that was basically a technical issue. But that's the nature of Lutzenberger. And this is what he said about the GNP. He says, not only is unending growth seen as a necessity, I'm going to digress again. David Suzuki calls this an unending economic growth, the ideology of the cancer cell. <laughs> Not only is unending growth seen as a necessity, growth is also measured in ways that, again, have little to do with social and environmental realities. Gross national product, the GNP, only adds up money growth. Under the false assumption that what matters is people's incomes, this measuring stick totally leaves out considerations concerning how that income is arrived at. So when a country demolishes mountains, raises forests, exterminates species to earn foreign currency in exports, the only income is added up in the GNP. Nowhere in the national accounting is the loss of the forest and the impoverishment of the mine considered. When the destruction of the forest disrupt, disrupts it or extinguishes whole cultures or results in genocide for indigenous people, these irreversible losses are also not discounted. Even costs are added up as if they were progress. Costs of pollution control and medical costs, where the health of the population deteriorates, are also added into the GNP without any deduction. He also pointed out, you know, if there's a big plane crash, the GNP will go up because there's lots of money exchanged for, you know, the undertakers, the ambulances, the activities. The uh, Alaska, after Exxon Valdez, of course, had a tremendous economic boom because the costs to the environment of the gooey oil and the dead birds and the dead sea otters doesn't count in the GNP. It just measures economic activity. Now, Lutzenberger isn't an economist, so I'm going to quote some people who are. And I'm going to, since I've been mentioning books as I go along, this is another, another plug. This is an excellent book that, again, should be in every school library. 
It's a Canadian book produced by the Royal Society of Canada, which is our sort of premier institution of the various sciences, social sciences and whatever. It's called Planet Under Stress. It's also Oxford University Press. And it's a collection of essays. If those of you who really love that slide that Stephen Schneider showed of, the, of Europe at night with all the bright spots, that picture's in this book too. It's got some real interesting background. Anyway, the chapter on global economics is written by two economists. I've got to admit, they're not mainstream economists. But they work at the World Bank, Robert Goodland and Herman Daly. They're the senior environmental economists for the World Bank. And what they point out is, and they have a long chapter on this, our reliance on GNP as a major tool of standard economics, as a primary yardstick of progress, is an obstacle. This is because the GNP measures do not, see, the GNP measures not the satisfaction of wants or needs, but simply production for any purpose resulting from any activity. Depletion of mineral reserves and ecosystems is counted on the same basis as sustainable use of resources. A nation encouraged to maximize GNP may choose to liquidate its natural resource base by rapidly cutting down forests or mining its mineral resources, and will get brownie points <laughs> for doing that from many international development agencies. Moreover, rapid obsolescence of consumer products increases the GNP. If A buys five cars, each lasting only two years, and B buys one car that lasts ten years, both get ten years of transportation, but A contributes more to GNP. Their final thought in this one chapter in Planet Under Stress is, there must be an alternative to running the Earth as if it were a business in liquidation. Okay. So this is, the economic system globally is clearly one of those, when you get past symptoms, it's clearly a cause. The economic system that we've adopted, and it's not a question of free enterprise versus communism, they all do the same thing. They want unending economic growth. It's not, a, it's not an ideological argument I'm putting forward here. It's a question of figuring out where do social needs, where do human needs interact with what might have worked in Adam Smith's day, but no longer makes sense. Lutzenberger also points out something about market forces. The market is irrational. The market only counts, for instance, it's supposed to be supply and demand. Well, most of the world is starving, so they must be demanding food. But that will never show up in any economic system because those people don't have money. You see, that's the problem. You need to have money to show up in the system. Another thing about market forces, and this is a, another one of Lutzenberger's analogies. Suppose the Mona Lisa, one of the world's most valuable paintings, was up for auction. Okay, you'd imagine, okay, so they go into the hundreds of millions, except in this imaginary auction, the millionaires are all gone, and there's only shoeshine boys in the room. Okay? So the, the Mona Lisa tops is going to go for five dollars. Now that's what's happening to the Amazon. The Amazon is worth a huge amount of money in terms of what its value is to the planet. It, it's a great air conditioner. If it weren't for the Amazon and that cloud forest, the heat that goes around the world would just heat up. It, it holds carbon out of the environment. You've heard Stephen Schneider say that tropical forest loss is probably 20% of greenhouse effect. So the developing world does have a role in getting us out of the mess we're in. But who values the rainforest? Well, it's just as if the millionaires were out of the room. Because I've seen them, the cattle ranchers in the Amazon would rather burn the forest to get it out of the way. It has a negative economic value to them. They don't see any value at all. They don't care about the rainforest. It's just in the way. Now, if those of us who were, in global terms, the millionaires and the market forces could get there, who else is left out of this system, of the market system? People with no money aren't part of the market system. How about future generations? How do they get in here? How do they say, these are our demands, we want to see the supply? That's how things are supposed to happen. The things that people, if it's in small supply, but large demand, it becomes very valuable. Right? That's how economics works. Well, where are all those other important players? How about other creatures on the planet? Non-human life forms. They don't count at all in market forces. So those are the kinds of things that mean that traditional econ economics has to be revamped. And that's what some of the ec economic experts like Goodland and Bailey are saying. We have to look at these things again and figure out how do we de devise a system that reflects the importance of meeting human needs. Well, that's basically what the Brundtland Report talked about. And I'm going to get back briefly to the idea of sustainable development because it is controversial. 
we talked about it a little bit at this conference. And the definition of sustainable development in the Brundtland Report is really simple and easy to understand. It's development that meets the needs of the present without sacrificing the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, in light of this big consumer book push that I was just talking about, I think there's something significant in the Brundtland definition. We know that to bring all people on the planet up to our current standard of consumption, I'm not going to call it a standard of living, but up to our current standard of consumption, we'd have to have something on the order of a seven-fold increase in everything that we're doing. Fossil fuel, industrial production, you name it. We go off the charts, the planet dies. Okay. So if that's not a, an option, we can't meet the wants of all the people on the planet to the level that we now want stuff and consume stuff. But the Brunson definition talks about meeting human needs. It doesn't talk about wants at all. So you can start focusing on that. What are human needs? Food, clean water, 40,000 children die every day on this planet, mostly because they can't get clean water. Shelter, clothing, education, it's really important. Literacy, every child on the planet should be able to read. You know, in terms of population, it looks like an insoluble problem, all these people having babies and how do you want to stop them and you don't want to interfere and life is sacred and what do you do about population, it's a very thorny issue. One interesting thing is that in every country in the world that's ever had this, it happens everywhere, it's absolutely without fail. When the, when the literacy rate of women in a country goes up, the birth rate goes down. When women's quality of life improves beyond misery, the birth rate goes down. They're able to take the time to care and look after one or two children instead of having eight or nine or ten in the hopes that some will live. So when the quality of life, when the ability to read, when the woman's ability to work out of the home in the workforce goes up, statistically, the birth rate goes down. So we can look at a lot of basic human needs. And I think that in some cases, we haven't met even basic human needs in North America. Now, I'm not talking about, we have, of course, people who don't get enough to eat in North America. But I think that in one place at least, in one way at least, some of the people in the developing world are doing much better than we are. And that in the sort of the non-economic, um, non-material thing. And I've traveled up quite a bit in countries where people are very poor. And one thing you notice is that there's always a sense of an extended family. It's more like small communities here. We've really lost it in larger communities in North America. There's a sense of an extended family. If somebody's in trouble or a child needs to be looked after, there's no worry to drop them off with the neighbor, there's no, which is often a neighboring hut. There's a sense of extended community, extended family, and what there is also, there's often, most often, a strong sense of religious values. There's a sense of a person's place in the, not just in their own community, but they have a sense of their place in the universe, <laughs> a sense of what their, what their role is in relation to other people, but also in relation to a creator or whatever. So they have perhaps a richer inner life. They have perhaps a richer spiritual life than a lot of people in North America do. And when you think about it, some of the human needs that we have can't just be tallied up in terms of food, water, shelter, BCRs. And it's the old notion of man does not live by bread alone. I mean, I think some basic human needs are for love. Those are basic human needs. A person without love isn't going to be happy no matter how much junk they've got. And our society doesn't do anything to foster love. Now I know this sounds like maybe getting silly, but I think it's really important to focus on that. Because if we're at this crossroads and we don't know which road we're taking, we want to take the road that leads to a society that's not just full of technological fixes, right? We just don't want to put, it would be pretty meaningless, frankly, if we just put extra scrubbers on every chimney and extra filters on every tailpipe and try to clean up the mess as we make it. We need to fundamentally change what our priorities are as a society. We need to choose the road that takes us to a place where no child is unwanted or unloved, where nobody wanders around in a shopping mall and thinks the most fun thing to do is try to shoplift, and where there's absolutely no reason to ever take drugs. Right? That's the kind of place we want to move to. So that not only when I talk about environment, I'm not only talking about human rights and social justice for people in the developing world. And I'm talking about improving the quality of life here for us now. 
so that we choose a path that leads us in a way that we have a better society in Canada, as well as making sure the needs are met for all of our billions of brothers and sisters in the developing world. It's a different kind of thought. <laughs> Somebody likes it. <laughs> agency that made this kind of point. I couldn't believe it. UNESCO published something called the Vancouver Declaration, in which they said that the material growth in the first world has been ac accompanied by an impoverishment of spiritual values. Now, it's very rare that you find anybody talking about industrialized countries as being impoverished, but I think we are in that way. So, there's another thing about roads that I've thought of. We know from the last two or three days of of talks, you know how, and I didn't want to focus on all the apocalyptic things that can happen to us if we don't change. We know they're out there. We know that if the ozone layer continues to thin, ultraviolet radiation will get in, more skin cancers will occur, it will harm plankton in the ocean, it will compromise the food chain. We know that global warming could result in the melting of polar ice caps, the flooding of coastal regions, increased droughts in our prairies and misery for people uh, who are displaced, countries that completely go underwater and so on. We know about all of these things. And one of my other favorite little you know, quotes is supposed to be a Chinese proverb, which is very straightforward, which is, if we don't change our course, we'll wind up where we're headed. Okay? So, we know those, those sort of darker visions of where we're headed, but we also know as Stephen Schneider showed us on a graph, that there is more than one road. There are a range of roads we can take. And it is possible, when you think about what the root causes of the problems are, and say, okay, one of the root causes has got to be the level of consumption in the industrialized world, and the inequity that the developing world gets so little while we get so much. That's a root cause. The third world debt is a root cause. It forces countries, it even connects with the military because the third world debt forces countries to try to be good debtor countries and get more money from the banks. They have to adopt austerity measures, which often mean devaluing their currency, which means poor people can't afford food anymore. It means that they grow cash crops where they could have grown food because they need things for export. You know, when they had the worst of the drought in Africa, in the Sahel region, and, and the Ethiopians were starving, that five Sahelian countries that year had record cotton crops for export. They, they could have been growing food, but they were growing cotton because they needed the export money to pay off their debts. And did you know that the developing countries, for all the things we think about that we're giving them money, we have such good agencies, we've got our Oxfam, we've got our government agency feed us, and all the rich countries in the world are supposed to be giving money to poor countries, did you know that when you subtract the money we give them from the money they have to give us to pay off interest on their debts, they give us more money than we give them? See, so that's nuts. So these are the kinds of root causes, focusing on third world debt, focusing on consumption patterns, things that we can do ourselves. Every time that we make this statement and push our political leaders and say, look, we aren't going, we don't want your energy scenarios to focus on endless growth. We want to start seeing energy scenarios that focus on negative growth based on energy efficiency, conservation, and the fact that we want to do more with less. It's very possible to do more with less. So those are the directions we want to move in. Well, last time I was here, I, I don't want to keep talking too long because I want to have more time for questions and answers, so I'm going to stop just about now. But there's one thing I wanted to do because last time people thought it was really helpful. And I think it was helpful for me, too. I didn't tell you last year that when I talked to you about despair, and I don't know how many students were here last year. A couple of you? Yeah. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. One of the hardest things in working with these issues is that when you start reading a lot about the greenhouse effect or ozone depletion, or we haven't even talked about the loss of biodiversity, the fact that we probably lose four species an hour that go extinct around the world, those kinds of statistics and that information can make you feel uh, sort of hopeless about it all. There's a risk of feeling as though, well, I can't make much difference, it's just me. Um, how can we change things? Human beings for the whole history of our being on the planet 
have never done it, what's best for the planet. It, our history has been dominated by greed and power struggles. So what are we going to do? Is it possible to change away, turn away from all that human history and be a different kind of species, do things that are for the best for each other and for the planet? And sometimes it is possible to feel very discouraged, especially if you're in a smaller town or here, for instance, if people working at, uh, on the cell bar expansion feel that they're threatened or harassed by neighbors that really want it, so you feel physically threatened. These things make it very hard to keep going. And it also is discouraging for, well, for all of us. And it happens to everybody. So what I do all the time is what I'm going to do with you now. Now, if you think about the planet as Gaia, which was a theory that, that Dr. Cummings put before you, that the planet isn't just rocks and water and soil and stuff, but there's actually the concept that the planet is one organism. Jose Lutzenberger believes this too. He's had a book out called Gaia, in which he points out that in one organism, he doesn't like, Lutzenberger, by the way, doesn't like the analogy spaceship Earth, because that just puts us as passengers on a spaceship. And he said, no, we're an organism, the planet Earth, and we shouldn't fight with each other as an organism any more than my kidney would suddenly get up and start fighting with my liver. If we're one organism, we work together. Okay? So that's sort of the Gaia concept. Now, we can admit right now from everything we know, when we talk about symptoms, symptoms are usually, the word symptoms usually associate with something being sick, and those are the symptoms. So we can agree right now that the planet is suffering from a number of diseases, and we can see the symptoms. And the cause for the planet's illness is our behavior as human beings. But we are part of the organism. We're not separate from the planet. So what I do is sort of as an analogy to visualization that works with cancer patients. It often works. Doctors don't know why. And you've probably heard about this, that when cancer patients visualize an increase in little white blood cells that gobble up disease, they get better faster. Now, if we're all part of an organism, why can't we visualize the health of the planet too? Not just to make ourselves feel better, but to actually make a difference. This is what I do. I may be crazy, but it does help keep going in the movement. It does keep you from burning out. And it just might be a way that we connect with the planet, get high on nature, and also help in the healing process. Because what we're talking about with the planet isn't just stopping the brutalization of the planet. This is not just a way to stop beating your planet question. This is a question about healing. When do we stop abusing the planet and begin a healing process? So with all of that preamble, let's just try it and see what happens. Okay, so I want you all to close your eyes. I only do this in Nelson. I want you to know. <laughs> you close your eyes and relax. Take a few deep breaths. And what I want to do is I'm going to count to 10. And I want you to see yourself going down a path. And when we get to the number 10, you're going to be in a place that you can choose to go to. It's a place in nature. Now, it's, it can be a place that you make up in your imagination or it can be a place that you go to a lot that you know really well. Maybe it's right near where you live. Maybe it's a place you went once in Costa Rica. But when we get to 10, you'll be in your favorite place in nature. So start walking down the path. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, you're there. You're in your favorite place. You can look around. Smell the air. Put your hands down and feel the soil or whatever's on the ground. Maybe it's nice spongy moss. Listen. Listen for birds or chattering. Take in your whole environment in your favorite place in nature. Peaceful. Smells perfect. And this is a place you can come to anytime. It's always there. And from this place, you can only do things that make you feel better, more positive, more healthy. What we're going to do next is go out into the future with a positive vision 
of the planet. We're going to go out to the year 2020. We're going to start very slowly. You start feeling that you're getting lighter. And it's a funny feeling, but you suddenly feel your feet leave the ground and you're actually floating. You're floating straight up. You can feel maybe the branches against your face. Wherever you are, you can look down. And it's a beautiful feeling. You're just floating up, getting up higher and higher. Look around you. Take it all in. Floating up, up. You're at treetop level, and you're still floating. Now stretch your arms out. And you'll feel that your fingertips are feathers and your feet have turned into talons and you're an eagle. And now you can really fly. Start flying. You have an incredible eyesight. You can see so well. You can see right down to the tiniest field mouse. So start flying and you realize that in this quality of being a spirit eagle, you can go anywhere as fast as you think about it. So you can beat your wings and fly like an eagle, you can soar, and you can move at the speed of light or the speed of thought. What we're going to do is take a tour of the planet and make sure that she's healthy in the year 2020. Start wherever you were in your place in nature and start flying. We want to find ourselves on the BC coast, so do what it takes to get there and start flying along the old growth temperate rainforest. And you look down at the Carmana Valley, and it's so green. They never clear cut there. Okay, keep flying, flying north. Go over Clockwood Sound. Yeah, it's beautiful, it's perfect, and it's green. Keep flying, I might go up. Let's check out the Cats and Cheese. It's perfect. No copper dams, no copper mines, nothing, no tailings. It's beautiful. There's more doll sheep than ever. Okay, keep going. Fly over any place you want to think about. And we're going to start flying across the country. See the prairies green with grain. And you can see lots of animals chirping around. Even a little burrowing owl that used to be almost extinct from pesticides. Stop and look and it's fine. They stopped using all those chemicals. And the birds are fine. When you're flying, notice that if you fly right over a city, it doesn't burn your eyes at all. The air is sweet, even over the cities and look down and see the people. Make sure the people are okay too. Take it all in. Let's check out James Bay. Fly to Northern Quebec. Look down and find the Great Whale River, the Nottawa, the Broadback, the Rupert. They're flowing straight and clear out to James Bay and Hudson Bay. The belugas are swimming. It looks perfect. We never built the dams there that they've been thinking of back in 1990. Fly along. Check any place you're worried about. And notice how beautiful and green and healthy and blue and perfect the planet looks. Fly south now. Let's go to tropical rainforests in the Amazon. And that green blanket extends as far as the eye can see. There's no smoke to hurt your eyes. They stopped burning the rainforest years and years ago. Fly over the villages of indigenous people. See that they look well. Fly south to the cities of Rio and Paulo. See that people there look happy and well fed. There used to be millions of children there who didn't have homes, but they seem healthy and well now. Fly over, fly further and further west towards Malaysia. Look at those rainforests, Malaysia, Indonesia. And green and healthy. Fly all over the planet 
and your magic eagle wings to notice that people are happy, animals are happy, the planet is healthy. Now go out and let's check the largest part of our planet, which is water. So fly out over an ocean and prepare to dive down as if you were going to catch a salmon and then splash, keep going. Go right into the water and you'll find that you turn into a whale. You can be a dolphin if you want. You're swimming along and everywhere you look, the water is clean. The fish populations have made a comeback. You don't see plastic or garbage. The water tastes good. The oceans are full of life. Swim over to some coral reefs and find that they are thriving with hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of brightly colored fish. Swim through the ocean. Visit the other creatures. Splash your flukes against the surface. Jump for joy if you want. Enjoy the feeling of being a whale. Now I want you to float back up towards the surface of the water. And you hit the water and you just keep floating. You're back in your body and you're floating higher and higher and higher above the planet. You're getting above treetops, above skyscrapers. You're going faster and faster and faster now. You feel the air cold against your face as you go higher and higher through clouds and higher and higher till you're in outer space. Just keep floating upwards till you get about to the moon. And then stop and look back and look at the planet and know that it is a small, blue, fragile, watery ball. Look at it and know that it is perfect. Know that it was created in perfect balance and harmony. And now know that you also were created in perfect balance and harmony. That you are perfect and that you can make this vision real. Open your eyes. God bless. Was the people in opera just starting and stuff? But if, if we can all just think, this is all interrelated, like you say, everything's related. With the warming of the, the globe, of the earth, with the greenhouse effect and stuff, that can only complicate problems like drought and stuff. And like, think about it this way: like, with countries that are starving now, what are they going to do when we're having trouble feeding our own people? When our bread baskets dry up because of problems like the greenhouse effect? Thanks. I want to mention that was a, that, yeah. I forgot to say that this isn't really for questions and answers unless you really have a question. I think this is a perfect time for students to share how they feel, and I prefer to hear from students at this point, and it doesn't have to be a question. That kind of comment is what we should have. I know I have to 
actually from your point, Mary, do you want to feel something? Does anyone have an interesting experience being aware of being an eagle that you'd be prepared to share? It's um, not an interesting experience. It's a quote that I heard just recently. Um, it was an ironic quote because it said, the world has been striving for something that is dependable, that won't break down, and don't need to fix all the time. But we found, we found something, but unfortunately it's a disposable diaper. And I was wondering what you had, what um, ideas you had about recycling. Well, it's interesting about disposable diapers. There's another indispensable household item that we never had 20, 30 years ago. I mean, that has been a hard sell to convince people instead of reusing cotton to, to buy something that costs a substantial chunk of your budget as a household when you keep keeping a baby in throwaway diapers. So, um, getting back to, and it's also another thing, we always hear about jobs versus the environment. Does anyone remember a hue and cry about all the diaper services that went out of business when disposables came along? No. So there's jobs to be had in changing our way, and that's another really important thing to remember. There's jobs, there'll be more jobs in a sustainable society. That's one thing I meant to mention. The only government I know that's actually done a study of this was the Netherlands, and they commissioned a study of what would happen if they adopted a no-growth scenario for the future. They were kind of prepared for the worst. What happens if we stop economic growth in the Netherlands, right? The answer was they'd have an increase in employment. That they'd take more people to do more things in a decentralized, low scale way. So, your question was about recycling. And I thought, well, actually, I hope I get your name right. What Lena Momsis said yesterday is the concern that I have too that people will start thinking that just because we're recycling, doing one of the R's, that that's enough. Now, we have at least four R's. There's reuse, which is very important. It's a much, it saves more energy and saves more raw materials by far to wash out a glass bottle and reuse it than to throw it in a blue box where it will get crushed and a lot of energy gets used and it's reproduced into some other kind of glass. That certainly recycling is a much higher use than throwing it into the landfill, but reuse is the first of the three R's, the four R's, and one we should do the most. There's also reduce. We want to reduce the amount of junk we bring home from the store. It doesn't make sense to buy two bags of groceries and unwrap everything and put it in the fridge and find that you have three bags worth of packaging left over. Do you ever notice that? I think it reproduces in the bag. Uh, there is a lot of junk that we bring home from the stores that we don't need, so the next R is reduce. Is recycle. There's also reject, which is another sort of akin to reduce. We can reject the things we don't need. My brother's come up with a fifth R and I come up with a sixth. My brother's fifth R is repent. <laughs> My sixth R is rejoice. So, it, it, but recycling is almost to the point of being almost dangerous because as important and as absolutely essential as it is that everyone recycle, it's so far short of being enough. And there were some public opinion results um, in the Ottawa Citizen, and I think probably other southern papers around the country recently, that showed that because of the level of environmental awareness, a lot of people were choosing biodegradable green products in the stores and they were recycling. And this was the main reason that the majority of people now believe that the environment's getting better. I mean, in the face of everything, in the face of, of uh, Alcan being exempted from environmental hearings, in the face of Rafferty going ahead without, you know, in contempt of the court order, in the face of James Bay, Hibernia, Point of Coney, just in Canada, we're going hell bent for leather on major mega projects. But everyone's beginning to feel better because we're recycling. So recycling is a first step, and it's important that once someone begins to recycle, that they remember to reuse, and they start making the links that remind them that one of the things we have to reject are politicians who don't get it. I'd like to say something about being aware. I found that when I started becoming interested in the environment, the more I read about it, the more I found out, the more I felt. Like, when I throw something away now, I feel guilty, because I know it's going to be in a garbage dump for a long time. I think that there's just different degrees of awareness, and the more we find out, the more we're going to feel 
And the better we feel about ourselves, the better it's going to be for our planet as well. Thank you.
rubber boom when they came into that area by harvesting the latex out of the trees. And they were being displaced, not only by the poor landless people, but by rich cattle ranchers who go in and burn down the rainforest. Why do the rich cattle ranchers burn down the rainforest? Well, it's actually not so great for cattle either. It takes a half ton of rainforest by a biomass. But when you put cattle on that land, half ton of rainforest gets converted to one hamburger. It's not very efficient. It, it makes in zero sense. It's insane because the cattle take a huge amount of area to try to find enough scrubby stuff to live off of because the land is so infertile once the forest is gone. So we were actually, these kinds of decisions were actually displacing the people who did know how to live in that area. Indigenous people, rubber tappers, people who've been making a living in the forest for hundreds of years were being displaced. When they built the dams in the Amazon, like the uh, Takuri Dam, the Balbina Dam, they flooded out people who knew how to live there, who knew how to survive. They poisoned rivers where hundreds of families had for years been able not only to fish for their own subsistence, they'd been wealthy by Brazilian standards selling their fish. All of those people were wiped out so that Brazil could have a hydroelectric dam so they could attract the aluminum smelters so that we could have aluminum cans, which is why instead of recycling aluminum cans, we should really get rid of them altogether. But when you think about it, these are the problems. They're not what do we do for those people? You're quite right. There are millions of people, billions of people, who need our help to reach a decent standard of living. It's not our individual fault, and it doesn't do any good to feel really, really guilty about it, but they're poor because we're rich. So we have to think about a way out of that. And the first step is to start our watching our own consumption patterns and convincing our politicians that we mean it. Because right now the biggest of bad, and we may not mean it, and we'll get angry later on when we don't have all the junk we now have. We also have to do those things that support indigenous people around the world, support small-scale societies that do live sustainably. And some, in terms of the Amazon, one thing you can do is you can buy products that contain Brazil nuts, because Brazil nuts can only be grown in the sand and rainforest. And even though there's lots of problems with some of Brazil nuts, but in the way that the people are paid very little, um, the organization I work with, Cultural Survival, we have our own Brazil nut plant in Acre, the Chico Mendes, co-op of Chapuri and produces Brazil nuts and it goes into candy. And it's not the whole answer, but it's a start. I first want to make a comment, um, Elizabeth. I, I think we're speaking, everyone, I'm speaking for everybody here. You've been an inspiration to us all and um, just keep up the damn good work. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm going to um, comment on the last speakers um, bringing up uh, the third world, the third world problem. And one thing is being, uh, going through the industrialization process. We, in, in a developed country, we have to offer the third world um, uh, subsidies. We have to offer them grants. Uh, we have to, we, we've gone through industrialization and it'd be hypocrisy not helping them get into what you call an, uh, our alternative ideas towards a better environment, and that's very important. And I also urge everybody here, we talk about um, cultures that are dying. There's a culture, um, a very, some of the most beautiful people you ever meet in the world. They're from the Sarawak Rainforest in, in Borneo, um, the Penang. Um, if you don't know about it, maybe uh, you'd be a better person to comment on that, but I think um, we all here should write to the M Malaysian consulate here in Canada and offering our, our support to these people so they can get what they're, what they're wanting and that's 20% of the province of Sarawak's rainforest to be preserved. It's a very important question you've raised. If everyone has their pen and papers out, I'm going to give you some ideas of things to do in relation to this question that was just raised. And then I'm going to have to go. I think our Irish will get back here in time for the next run to the airport. I'm sorry. But what I was going to say is, first of all, in relation to developing, A, to the developing world, it's really weird that while the public in Canada is so environmentally conscious, the polling results show that people don't seem to think that aid to the third world is important. So we've been steadily cutting back aid to the third world. And I think it's really important to, be, to write Mulroney and to write the minister responsible for CETA. I'm just trying to think of her name. Um, and 
tell them that you really want Joe Clark, right Joe Clark too, that you really want an increase, a substantial increase for environmental reasons for assistance to the developing world. Right, right, start writing those letters because the letters do, someone else made that point earlier, Ethan did, letters do count for a lot. And when they start getting flooded with letters that show the Canadian public is making a connection between poverty and the developing world and the environmental crisis, that'll make a difference. The other thing is in relation to Sarawak. Sarawak is the most heavily logged area of forest in the world. It's three acres of land, and the Penan and the other diet people are running out of space. Um, one of the loggers down there, all Japanese interests for the most part that buy up those logs, I could go on and on, like the Minister of Environment for Sarawak owns the largest timber trading company in the region, and when told about the greenhouse effect, he said, oh good, it rains too much, it ruins my golf game. So we've got some real evil guys there in Sarawak. So uh, one thing we can do is also boycott Mitsubishi. World Rainforest Week is coming up October 22nd. Oh, it starts soon. Yeah, so um, protests to Mitsubishi will help. Mitsubishi is kind of getting a hard rap on this one. There are other logging companies from Japan that take a lot more wood out of Sarawak, but Mitsubishi is the only company that has a brand name and ways that we can as consumers in North America boycott. So letters to Japan's embassy, letters to Malaysia's embassy, letters to Mitsubishi is saying we're not buying your products anymore to help stop the logging in Sarawak, as well as letters to Mulroney to say, Sarah, you know, Malaysia is a commonwealth country, we're involved with Malaysia, and we would like to see you use efforts to protect the remaining rainforest and the human rights of the Penang people. And I think I have to go. Thank you, Elizabeth. We all feel that the last respondent probably provided the thank you for Elizabeth already. However, I'd like to say that you've provided us fuel this morning to fire up our boilers to dissipate this warming heat throughout our variety of classrooms and the sessions to come for the rest of the day and many days to come. Let me extend the audience's appreciation one final time for such a thought-provoking presentation, Elizabeth. Our guest this morning is Matt Waldner. He's here representing Mohawk Oil. Mohawk Oil is a Western Canadian company and it's employee owned. Matt Waldner has a background in geology and has worked with Mohawk Oil for the last 10 years. He's most recently been assigned as manager of lubricants. Now that's his responsibility here is the plant that re-refines the oil. That's a little bit different than his in the program. This is most appropriate for this morning's talk. This morning's talk is going to be about what we shouldn't do with our oil. And then secondly, we'll discuss the process itself and why we should be using re-refined oil. Mr. Walden. Thank you, Dave. Uh, this is really getting tougher. I thought it was going to be a... Uh, fairly simple conference to uh, 
make a presentation at. But, uh, when I saw the program and, and some of the other individuals that are involved in this whole thing, uh, I really feel a, a long ways out of my depth. And Elizabeth certainly is about, I think she's an impossible act to follow. Uh, maybe I should, I should probably, I, I should give you some background as to where I come from. Right now I'm a, I'm manager of a lubricants business for, for Mohawk Oil. But my, I went to school in the 60s and graduated from UBC in geology. And I, I thought my progress, my, my, my work experience got me to this point where I am now. So this is about as far from geology as you can possibly get. Uh, my, I have a young, I have two, two boys actually. My youngest son just turned 11. And he said just recently, Dad, you take this job, does that mean you're not a geologist anymore? And I said, no, I'm always going to be a geologist. In fact, now uh, I found my, my technical training is really an advantage for what I'm doing now. Uh, and in fact, I prefer to call myself an earth scientist now rather than a geologist. Uh, I've also had the, one of the reasons I went into geology was uh, if you if you wanted to work in the bush and in the wilderness, in the wilderness, really the choices in the 60s were probably forced in geology. Uh, and I chose geology, and I had the advantage of of traveling in most of the wilderness areas in British Columbia. And it's that easy, uh, all through the Yukon. Uh, probably been places that people still have never been. And uh, it's, you know, it's that background where I'm coming from now that, that uh, the, the topic of used oil is really kind of a mundane kind of uh, affair compared to what Elizabeth was talking about. But I really believe that this kind of activity is something that individuals can focus on and do something about. And, and it is worthwhile. It's environmentally I believe the thing to do and the way to go. And I, I am really proud to be associated with a company like Mohawk Oil that is uh, really in the forefront of this sort of thing. I'm not so good at speaking off the cuff as people like Stephen Schneider or, or Elizabeth, so I'm going to have to <laughs> read from some prepared text to a great extent. When I was first asked to prepare this presentation, I thought I would limit the description to the re-refining process and the merits of lubricants produced by Mohawk. After all, when would be my next chance to uh, promote the company's products before our captive audience? However, upon reflection, I realized that an outline of the various dispositions of used oil would also be appropriate. What I hope to do today is shed some light on how Mohawk oil views used oil so that you can return home and hopefully implement some of the ideas you hear if you're an educator, to pass on the information to your students, and also if you're a student, to, to apply some of this information. I believe that education is the key to many of our environmental concerns. I expect from a teacher's and from a student's perspective, gathering factual information is mandatory and sometimes something of a challenge. Corporations motivated by profits may not entirely be open regarding their activities, especially if some of these may not be environmentally sound. I, for one, tend to be suspicious of company representations regarding the greening of corporate Canada. Now comes the pitch regarding Mohawk's credentials and credibility. The company is not a late coming to the environmental field. In the late 1970s, we began looking at the feasibility of recycling used oil. And actually, now after we've been talking about recycling, that, that I would like to also represent that this is probably more a reuse than a recycle of used oil. Uh, the lubricating qualities of, of oil never wear out, mineral oil. So in fact, the, the resource can be used over and over and over again. So this is, in fact, um, maybe termed a reuse of the product rather than a recycling. <clears throat> we struck out in what was going to prove to be unknown territory. The processing technology of the day turned out to be inappropriate. The infrastructure was not in place to collect the used oil and the general public, business, and government were not supported. Mohawk persevered over the past 10 years and is now beginning to pay dividends. The technology that we have developed 
the processors of our covered base oils is state of the art. We, is, we have received awards and recognitions for our pioneering efforts in used oil recycling, including the first Environment Canada Award for corporate environmental leadership for the entire country. We are especially proud of this achievement considering that we are a member of an industry that has less than a satisfactory environmental track record. The general public is becoming supportive of our efforts. Businesses concerned with the environment are purchasing our products. Governments have encouraged use of environmentally friendly products and lack an enacted legislation designed to protect the environment. All this has had a positive impact upon our recycling business. I would like to develop this topic by speaking first about the definition of used oil, the various ways it's disposed of, including what Mohawk believes to be the best alternative, a description of our business and process, and finally a case history of Mohawk lubricants, an example which I believe is a truly sustainable development. First, the definition. Everywhere the machinery operates, there's lubricating oil. Through this use, the oil is consumed or made ineffective. Oil that is not consumed gradually becomes dirty, the viscosity increases, the lubricating qualities diminish. All of us who operate a car know that eventually you must change the oil in the crankcase, transmission, differential. All of those who operate a car also know that you eventually change the oil in the crankcase. Oh, the, the dirty oil that is drained and pres is presents a disposal problem. The breaking down of the oil that requires you to change it is actually a degradation of the additive package and contamination of the lubricating oil. The mineral oil itself does not deteriorate. And in fact, there is evidence to suggest that the oil may in fact be further re-refined during normal operating processes. The lubricating oil is composed of base oil, which in most cases is a mineral oil. Some lubricants are synthetic, in fact, cannot be reprocessed in, reprocessed in Mohawk's plant. These oils are most common in aircraft industry and do not comprise a large volume. The mineral oil, the mineral base oil in the majority of lube oils provide the basic lubricating requirements of an engine. However, all lubricating oils are blended products containing additives in addition to the base oil. These additives strengthen or modify certain characteristics of the base oil. The most common additives are detergents, uh, oxidation inhibitors, dispersants, viscosity improvers, alkalinity agents, anti-wear agents, uh, the list goes on. It is these additives that preclude the reprocessing of used oil in a conventional crude oil refinery, since there's a tendency for the additives to follow a conventional processing plant. And in fact, this following problem is the main obstacle in, in developing a process of our own. Some things that are not used oil should also be defined, since contamination of the used oil feed to our plant can cause problems. We are not set up to process paint thinners, solvents, antifreeze, uh, PCB contaminated oil, um, and such items as cover oil. Oil, can, oil filters and that sort of thing. It's amazing some of the things we have found in the used oil tank. Uh, there, was a, there was a case where there was a pair of coveralls in the used oil tank. We, I, for the life of us, we couldn't figure out how the guy had gotten in there. <laughs> anyway, so if you're depositing your used oil, make sure it's just oil you're putting in the tank. As a, pre <clears throat> as a preamble to Mohawk's remedy for dealing with used oil, I would like to set the stage. Here we can have the lights down and uh, the first slide. Uh, Approximately 300 million liters of used motor oil is dumped every year in Canada. Next slide, please. This is the equivalent of about seven Exxon Valdez oil spills. And in fact, the largest single water pollution, oil pollution of water by oil is dumped used oil. It's not, it's not a marine disasters like the Exxon Valdez. In British, <clears throat> in British Columbia, it's estimated that there is between 40 and 60 million liters of collectible used oil generated annually. Much of this oil finds its way into our water. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
pollutes the land and even find its way into our food. Perhaps to the next slide. The used oil is dumped in landfills, in the sewer, and in our forests. In addition, it is, in addition to dumping, the used oil is burned. Next slide, please. Not only is it a waste of a valuable resource and inefficient use of oil, it also, result, also results in pollution of our air, water, soil, and it allows dangerous chemicals and heavy metals to be introduced into the food chain. Next slide, please. There was a case recently on Vancouver Island where a commercial greenhouse had for many years been burning used oil to provide heat for the buildings. A housing subdivision planned for the site was not allowed until a complete site cleanup was completed. The soil in the vicinity of the greenhouse was so high in heavy metals and other contaminants that the property was declared unsafe for residential development. One would also suspect that the vegetables that have been grown in the greenhouse may also have been contaminated. Road oiling is still a common practice in some areas. This is essentially the same as dumping as far as we're concerned, since road oil finds its way into the soil and the water. Experimentation with biodegradation of used oil has also been attempted by plowing used oil into the ground. Once again, this disposal route seems inappropriate and wasteful. Next slide, please. Mohawk believes the best disposal route for used oil is recycling. The next slide. Not only is the environment the most sensible alternative, it helps to conserve a valuable, non-renewable, reusable resource and reduce our dependence on foreign crude and frontier crude oil. Next slide, please. Not only individuals, but companies and businesses must be encouraged to recycle in order to avoid pollution and other problems related to inappropriate storage of used oil. Um, Anybody who's changing their own oil can go to the local Mohawk station here in Nelson and most of our Mohawk stations do have used oil collection tanks where, where you can drop your, your used oil free of charge and Mohawk will pick it up and you move it down to a refinery. There's also some recycling depots in the province that will accept used oil as well. Let me just run through the next two or three slides. Recycling used oil is not a new idea, but our refining process is significantly different from the older technologies. Next slide, please. For many years, recyclers have, have been filtering used oil to remove some of the dirt and reselling the product at a discounted price. These old filtering processes do not remove the spent additives, water, fuel contaminants, and heavy metal contaminants, and even all the dirt. Some other processes do produce a base oil of better quality, but generate dangerous byproducts. More want to go beyond a simple filtering or acid clay process and recover premium base oil stocks so that high quality lubricating oil can be blended from the re refined base oil. At the same time, the byproducts have to be environmentally acceptable and be able to be disposed of easily. The re refining process that eventually was developed by Mohawk is state of the art. This proprietary process is employed at our North Vancouver plant and is also sold under license internationally by the company. All products produced at the North Vancouver plant are, are either environmentally benign or can be reused. Two viscosities and neutral base oil are produced which are used in production of new blended lubricants. Byproducts recovered from the used oil include water, fuel, an Atari residue which contains suspend additives, dirt, and heavy metals. Spent caustic and catalyst from the hydrotreating process are the only other plant byproducts. Before we review the actual process, it may be interesting to discuss how the used oil is collected and eventually arrives at the North Vancouver plant for processing. A used oil collection network has been established by Mohawk covering the entire province. The used oil is collected from public storage tanks and businesses that generate used oil. The oil is then transported in small tanker trucks to depots strategically located in Prince George, Kamloops, um, on Vancouver Island near Nanaimo, and at our plant in North Vancouver. The waste oil is then transported by larger tankers from the smaller depots in North Van. Small used oil tanks used by various individuals are also installed in most Mohawk service stations. As I mentioned, there's one here in Nelson. 
fee is levied for collecting the used oil based on the cost of pickup and transportation to the refinery. <coughs> Mohawk does not charge individuals to drop the oil at our stations and collects free of charge of the public service of the recycling depots. The aim of the collection service is to operate at break even, landing used oil at the plant at no cost. This has been necessary for the economic operation of the entire business. In fact, if anyone had, had uh, attended the recycling workshop yesterday, uh, I think it, it may, I hope it became obvious that, that a major cost of recycling is transportation. That uh, when you talk in pure economic terms, a lot of times the, 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 cost, the value of the goods that you're transporting may be uh, considered uh, less than the cost of the actual transportation. Certainly establishing an effective network in British Columbia has been a, really, a real challenge based on uh, the topography and the rugged coastline we've had to do, deal with. You know, on the processing side of it. This first slide shows the, the first step in the process in the processing in the processing plan we have. Once the used oil lands in North Vancouver, <coughs> is analyzed for undesirable contaminants such as PCBs and bunker oil. There's a full-scale laboratory on site where used oil can be now analyzed. The used oil is typically composed of about 10% water, about 15% fuel, uh, about 15% additives, and about 60% lubricating oil. If the analysis shows the oil is acceptable, it's transferred to larger holding tanks to await, to await processing. The refining process is a staged distillation under varying temperatures and pressures, followed by hydro treatment. The products recovered in the plant are strictly a function of the used oil composition. At the first stage, water and some light fuel is driven off by boiling. Control temperatures and pressures maintain the other components of the used oil in liquid state. The water and light fuel mixture are fed into the main process furnace. Here the water is vaporized and some energy value recovered from the light fuel which is essentially gasoline. Next slide please. The second stage in the process involves higher temperatures. During this phase, a heavy fuel is recovered. This fuel is essentially uh, a fuel oil or a diesel product. Presently we sell the fuel. However, we are currently looking at installing a new process furnace capable of burning this liquid fuel and reducing or limiting our dependence on natural gas, which is uh, our main energy source right now. Uh, again, this, this plan is, is not just a matter of sticking a furnace in and, and starting to burn the product. We've got to make sure that, that the emissions that we, that we do have are uh, not only acceptable, but but uh, the company feels that, that we can't just meet standards set by, by waste management. We have to be sure that the emissions that come out of the plant are, are, uh, are as safe as we can possibly make them. So it would involve a lot of scrubbing and this sort of thing to do with the uh, furnace stack emissions. Uh, next slide, please. The liquid fraction that comes off the bottom of the second stage provides the feed for third stage. During this stage, a light distance is recovered. This is essentially tin weight oil, which contains a few impurities. This product is termed 150 distillate. This distillate goes to the hydro treater. The hydro treating stage is essentially a catalytic reaction which removes compounds such as sulfur using hydrogen generated in a neighboring plant and a weak solution of caustic soda. The hydro treater is, excuse me, the hydro treater is a batch mold and can operate independently from the rest of the plant. After hydro treating, the 150 distillate is recovered, converted to neutral 150 neutral base oil, which essentially is a, a tin weight oil. Next slide, please. The final, the final stage in the distillation process is at higher temperatures again. At this stage, a 450 distillate is recovered. This would be about a 30 weight oil. This distillate, like the 150, is also run through the hydro treater. The result is a, is a 450 neutral base oil. The bottoms from this last stage is a residue which contains dirt, spent additives, and heavy metal. The residue is sold to the asphalt industry as a additive in roofing asphalt. And there's been some experimentation as well in using the, uh, the, the residue in, 
in, uh, in pavement as well. We've uh, conducted leachability tests on this material and they've proved that the additives and heavy metals remain trapped in the, in the residue. So, so the, the heavy metals that are there uh, don't end up getting into the, into the water system or whatever else. Next slide. As mentioned already, the output from the hydro treater is 150 and 450 base oils. Two distillates are batch fed into the hydro treater from stages three and four of the white thin film evaporator process. The spent caustic from the hydro treater is used by the pulp and paper industry. The spent catalyst is recycled. The neutral base oils, <coughs> excuse me, the neutral base oils are either sold to other lube oil blenders or used as a base stock for Mohawk's own blended oils. Maybe run through the next two slides. Okay. The blended products are then packaged for sale either through Mohawk's retail outlets or sold to industrial accounts and other retailers. The majority of products sold are sold in bulk in returnable reusable containers. All Mohawk lubricants meet or exceed the Society of Automotive Engineers. SAE for short, specifications, <coughs> specifications and all manufacturers engine warranty specifications. In fact, Mohawk lubricants are probably a bargain. Since we do not want to risk having a problem that can be blamed on parts being made from recycled oil, the engine oil specifications tend to be on the high side of the scale. For example, SAE minimum viscosity index for 30 weight oil, engine oil, is 9.5. Mohawk's minimum requirements for the same oil is 10.8. Duckham's oil, approved for use in such automobiles as Rolls Royce and Jaguar, are blended under license by Mohawk using our base oils produced at the North End plant. Products are put into service in a variety of applications, including lubricating, as well as lubricating oils, includes uh, hydraulic oil and that sort of thing as well, which we can also recover and, and reprocess. Eventually, these lubricants become used oil again. The cycle can begin again from collection through processing, production of blended products. Let me just bring the lights up. Or maybe there's one more slide for that. That's a that's a, a reflective image of uh, the the refinery in North Vancouver. Can okay, maybe bring the lights up again? Now that you are fully convinced that recycled oil and flying Mohawk's process is the only reasonable alternative for disposal of used oil, you may be interested in the actual case history of the birth and growth of sustainable development. And, and I'll uh, tell you the preamble. This is a very painful birth and growth that we've gone through here. In the late 1970s, Mohawk purchased under license a technology designed to recover base oil from used oil. The turnkey operation had a design capacity equal to the collectible used oil available in all of British Columbia. The economics of the project looked reasonable and the positive environmental impact convinced the Mohawk Board of Directors that this was a project worth pursuing. A couple of years and several million dollars later, it was discovered this laboratory process would not work on a large scale. The plan would work for a few weeks and we'd have to totally dismantle it, clean out all the pipes and start all over again. Eventually, we reached a settlement with uh, the supplier of the, of the plant and all the equipment was torn out. Mohawk then went to work over a period of about another two years on a research and development project for developing a process for re-refining the used oil. Uh, a pilot plant was eventually built in North Vancouver. The used oil collection network was expanded to provide feed to the plant. The ongoing research and development project led eventually to the commissioning of a full-scale re refinery. After overcoming the technical challenge of, re of refining used oil, the marketplace changed on us. A barrel of crude oil dropped from $38 to $12, and the fair market value of lube oil also dropped accordingly. Our cost of processing was more than the value of the products produced, especially at reduced, produ at reduced production rates. Because of the size of the plant, the limited number of products that we do produce, the cost of producing a liter of base oil is higher than the base oil produced in a refinery which processes virgin crude oil. 
The major oil companies were not interested in purchasing our base oils. The environment at that time was not yet an issue. And recycled products were considered inferior to new. In order, in our base, in our case, base oil made from virgin crude was considered by some to be superior to our products re manufactured from re-refined oil. Some marketers even went so far as to advertise that their oil was not made from re-refined uh, base oil. That's since uh, changed around. You don't see that kind of advertising anymore. Mm -hmm. What had begun as what had begun as a technical challenge had become a marketing exercise. There was controversy within Mohawk as to whether we should come out of the closet as being producers and re-refiners of used oil. Uh, it, w it wasn't intentional that, that we were keeping this uh, a secret, but we certainly weren't advertising the fact that, that our oil was re-refined. And there even now is, is still some concern from certain individuals in the company that uh, if we go public with the fact that the most of the oil that Mohawk brands is re-refined, that we'll lose customers. Uh, but there's uh, that 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 group is tend to become a minority now with uh, the current concern for the environment. The economics of the business have been based on plant operating at near full capacity of 33 million liters of used oil processed annually. This equates to about 18 million liters of base oil production. We were operating we were operating about 50 percent of nameplate and losing money. The year 1989 saw a turnaround for Mohawk lubricants. Several major customers, including provincial government and, Bre and BC Transit, began using re refined oil in, in their equipment. We began racking up some impressive field tests for our products. The British Columbia government had enacted Special Waste Regulation 6388 and began enforcing the law. Generators of used oil were made responsible for its disposal. Mohawk's used oil collection service, licensed by the province, were authorized used oil collectors. The environment had become the number one issue with the general public and consequently with the governments at all levels. And I would like to call you people, all of us, the general public rather than consumers as, as Elizabeth had, had outlined. I, I'm insulted by the word consumer myself. Uh, I think we should change or just eradicate the term. One of, one of the highlights of 1989 came when Mohawk was awarded the Environment Canada Award for Corporate Environmental Leaderships for all companies in Canada. <clears throat> this was presented to the company in recognition of our work in recycled used oil. It has been more than 10 years since Mohawk initiated the idea of recycling used oil, and now it appears that it may finally be our turn. In 1990, several significant events took place. During the Globe 90 Environmental Conference in Vancouver, several projects announced its qualifying for Environment Canada's Environmental Choice Program, including Mohawk's re refined oil. In order to qualify, all petroleum-based lubricant oils must contain more than 50% by volume be refined oil, must meet various other specifications for content, safety, and performance, and meet or exceed North American standards established by the Canadian General Standards Board, SAE, and the American Petroleum Institute. The environmental choice was created to help consumers find products which use the burden on the environment. The ECHO logo is the symbol of certification from the player on goods that meet the criteria. During 1990, contracts were signed with two major oil companies to, to purchase re refined base oil. In fact, we're talking to a third major uh, oil company that's, that's uh, interested in purchasing the base oil from us as well. The oil industry now wants to become considered a solution to the problem rather than just a, the, the problem. The public response has been very positive, and this is probably one of the things that's been driving the, the majors as well. Consumers are now specifying re refined oil when they get their oil changed and insist on knowing what's being done with the used oil that is being drained from the crankcase.
Something better? The increase in the price of crude oil has <coughs> the increase in the price of crude oil has an overall positive impact on our business. Although you as uh, consumers or whatever we should call ourselves now may uh, <laughs> be not too happy with these price increases. We still price our base oil below market prices, but the prices increased dramatically since the prices in the Persian Gulf. The negative side is that there is more economic incentive now to burn the used oil as fuel rather than uh, put into such programs as recycling. In summary, we are looking forward to the 1990s. The environment has become the issue, and we believe the foresight that Mohawk showed in the 1970s will finally translate into profits for the company and benefit the country. However, our success will depend, or continue to depend on our customers. Sustainable development can only become a reality if the economics of the environment are integrated and the real cost of doing business takes into account the environmental impact of man's activity. Um, and we feel this way about other things besides just used oil. Fuel should be the same thing, that, uh, that the environmental impact of, of pumping a barrel of crude out of the ground and processing it, there's, there's no accounting whatsoever in current, environmental, in current economic practices for for taking into account that cost to the environment. <clears throat> In some cases, preservation of the environment may cost a few dollars more, but I believe that all of us are prepared to pay a little bit more now in order, to, in order to avoid paying a lot in the future. Also consider that true recycling is a closed loop. In order for recycling to succeed, you must use recycled products in addition to filling your blue recycling boxes. If you believe the Mohawk, if you believe with that what Mohawk is doing is worthwhile, support us by ensuring that used oil goes to reliable recyclers and buy recycled oil for your car and your business. And support environmentally conscious organizations that, uh, that are prepared to, to use environmentally friendly or friendlier products. Thank you. someone has to summarize what was said. Uh, luckily I have a science background, I'll do my best to help. It sounds like re-refined oil will work in your car. <laughs> we know that when we drain our crankcase, it's not a good thing to put it in our driveway or in the backyard in behind the bush somewhere, and now we have a place to take it which is the depository in Nelson. They take the bad things out of the oil, and what's left, I guess, is for us to provide our support to companies like Mohawk by both using and buying their products. I know I will start doing it, and I will start taking my oil to the depot. Thank you very much for coming.